Okay, next up is prairie restoration. Um, prairies have really high biodiversity, so getting it back to the historic um, condition is, is a little bit difficult. Um, they can, however, be at least partially restored in only a few years. So that means that um, you can kind of get more bang for your buck with prairies because you can um, restore small portions and at least get them part of the way there um, pretty quickly. Whereas you can imagine if you're going to restore a forest, it might take a long time for the trees to grow. Um, and the aquatic, depending on how large the aquatic system is, it can take a while. Um, for prairie restoration, um, shallow plowing, burning, and raking can help kind of kickstart the restoration process. Um, if only invasive or exotic plants are present, they can be removed by just plowing or applying herbicides and kind of starting from scratch. Um, native plants can be established by transplanting prairie sod, planting, or scattering seeds. Um, an easy method is to gather hay from a prairie, especially if it's nearby, and then spread it across the prepared site because all the seeds um, in the hay um, will um, provide a starting place for um, getting the prairie plants going. Uh, you don't want to add fertilizer because prairies um, do better. The fertilizer might actually help invasive species take hold more easily. Um, this shows some examples. This um, is the Civilian Conservation Corps from the 1930s um, that helped uh, do some prairie restoration. Um, and you can see this is what it looks like today. So um, you can have long-term success um, with some pretty basic practices. There is a conundrum for prairie restoration, and we've talked about this a little bit before. You need to kind of, in your goals, decide um, what your target is. What do you want um, the endpoint to be? Um, and so you could target before European colonization, like the 1400s. Um, you could um, target before human colonization, so before Native Americans were here, which is about 12,000 years ago. Um, and there have been some discussions about rewilding our prairies because there is evidence that the presence of people led to the decline um, of some large megafauna species. And so some people have um, argued that we should be adding in these um, megafauna back. So we used to have things like mastodons, um, and so we could, elephants are the closest relative um, to mastodons. There was an American cheetah, um, and so that's a thought. Um, and there were American camels and lions, and so, um, and this, they didn't go extinct um, as far as we can tell from climate change or anything, it's from people. So should that be part of our restoration conversation? And um, there is an existing species that kind of uh, is evidence of, of some of this. And I don't know, some of you may, especially if anybody's a wildlife major or minor, you might recognize this species. We don't have it in Louisiana. But this is the American pronghorn, or some people call it the American antelope. And it's the second fastest land animal. Um, so the only thing faster than the pronghorn is um, the African cheetah. And it can go 35 miles per hour for four miles, and it can hit speeds of 55 miles per hour for half a mile. Um, cheetahs can run faster for um, 65 to 78 miles per hour, but they can only go for 60 seconds at a time, um, if that. Um, it takes a lot of energy to, for them to go that fast, even for that short a time. Um, and the reason the pronghorn are so fast is because there used to be American cheetahs. And the American cheetahs have died off, but we still have um, the pronghorn. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And you can think about um, what you think our um, target should be for prairie restorations. Um, another type of... Um, Restoration project, this is another example um, in the tropical dry forest in Costa Rica. Um, they'd had some areas that were degraded from large-scale conversion to cattle ranches and cattle farms. Um, and they've been working to restore um, these types of ecosystems in the Guanacaste dry forest 
Conservation Fund. Um, normally when I give this lecture, I have a pair of earrings that are um, Guanacaste um, seeds um, that are the main trees in this type of dry forest. Um, but the goal here is to restore 130,000 hectares of land um, and also to restore some marine habitat that's nearby. This is led by Daniel Jansen, who is an American ecologist. And to do the restoration, they've been eliminating brush fires, logging, hunting, and livestock grazing, grazing planting trees. Um, and they've done a lot of what they call biocultural restoration, where they use the restoration process to teach um, students about biology and ecology. And so they've taught about 2,500 fourth through sixth graders. Um, and the residents are starting to view it as this large ranch providing wildland resources. And so um, this kind of connection with the community um, is really important um, for success of different projects. And this is just an example of that. And so this shows some pictures of the um, restoration project. Um, this is a degraded site and this is a restored site. And you can see this person is in here for scale, so you can see how tall the trees are now. Um, and this is Daniel Jansen um, showing off some of the restoration sites. The next topic um, is something that I didn't know was even possible until a few years ago. Um, and so we talked about how destructive desertification is, where these dry lands and um, dry forests and grasslands get turned into desert. And we talked about how um, areas that have suffered from desertification have much, much lower biodiversity than like a natural desert would. Um, so what causes desertification, overgrazing, um, harvesting too much uh, firewood and plants, um, once the plants are gone, um, it's hard for it to be a productive ecosystem. So what are some of these problems? Um, I want to uh, show you this video that shows kind of a success story of how they've started reversing desertification and some different methods that they've been using. <laughs> 